is this thing on? I am so glad that I have Jesus. I want to go ahead and get started. We're going to start with a text. If you would stand and if you have your Bibles with you, hopefully you do. Second Chronicles, the 15th chapter. That's the one in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 10, starting there. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the 15th year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord the same, the same time of the spoil which they had brought, 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul, that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire, and he was found of them. And the Lord gave them rest round about. Lord, I pray that you would touch your word tonight. Open every heart here to receive it. We know that your word is anointed. Help me to do the job that you want me to do. No more and no less. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And you may be seated. There was a story I heard years ago about three men stranded the whole thing, you know, stranded on a deserted island. Not a desert island, but a deserted island. Not too many desert islands in the ocean. But, uh, of course, as most of those stories go, they're walking along the beach and they find the little bottle. They rub it and a genie pops out. And says, I'll give you three wishes, only one wish each. And the first guy goes, well, I want to go home. He's gone. The second guy says, I want to go home. Boom, he's gone. And the third guy looks around and says, man, it's going to be lonely around here. I wish those guys were back. <laughs> and the point I want to make, I don't know if I've got a slide for my title or not, but so what, what do you want? Be careful what you want. In Esther chapter 5, verse 3, said, Then said the king unto her, talking about Esther, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. And then she said, Let the king and Haman come this day into the banquet that I prepared for him. Then in verse 6, and the king said, and this is after they got to the banquet, uh, King said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. I got a lot of mids ringing here. And then to Esther chapter 7 and verse 2, And the king said unto, again unto Esther, On the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall, and it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Uh, there are other occasions in the Bible where this happened. Uh, people were asked, what do you want? What's your uh, petition? What's your desire? And uh, in Mark chapter 6, verses 22 and 3, and when the daughter of said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod, and then that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, I will give it thee. And he swore unto her, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. These guys are really free with their kingdoms. First Kings chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. In Second Kings 2 and 9, it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. People who were asked, what do you want? Now, I've, I've talked about this before, but there was a dog in Kotzebue that I used to pass by. Um, he was just a couple blocks or so from our house. But the poor dog was frozen half to death, skinny as could be. Uh, his water dish was usually frozen over. 
and he was just left out there. And then one day I walked by and he was, he was dead. But even when he was alive, he could barely bark. He'd stand up and totter around and rrr, rrr. that was about it. That's all he could get out. There are people who are similar to the dog. Uh, while I was working in Kotzebue, there was also a, a man out there I think he came from what we what we referred to as Tent City, out uh, south south of the village and the airport and all, a uh, stretch of, of uh, tents and stuff. People lived out there. But there was a man lying outside the flight service one morning, wrapped in a blue tarp, about 25 below. And so, called the police. He could hardly talk. He was so cold. The hypothermia setting in. Um, he was taken to the hospital. And the next night, he was there again. And this, this, these are people who have nothing, no reason to continue living. Into the rotors, you have them in Alaska. They come up here just to get away from everything. Uh, people who commit suicide by police, since the police shoot them, they trump something up and they wave a gun around, so they'll shoot them. And uh, no hope, no reason to reach. They have uh, no reason to try. There's a spirit of hopelessness on them, and uh, they're destitute, and they have no desire to keep living. Now, Brother, Brother Morgan, people have said, you know, that when you meet the devil, there is a great fear there. And he said, no. He says, I met him. He says that the spirit is a spirit of hopelessness. It's not fear. It's hopelessness. The Bible tells of a man who was sick of the palsy. If you look, look that word up, it means he was a paralytic. He was paralyzed. We're talking 2,000 years ago, so um, no medical procedures. There are no surgeries, no rehab programs, no treatment centers, no government-funded social programs, no powered wheelchair to make his life any easier. His, basically, his world is maybe a three-by-six mat that he lives on. Someone has to take him to a street to beg. Someone has to take him anywhere he needs to go. Someone has to do everything for him. And his desire, what, if you ask him, what do I want? It, it's not about I want a bigger house. I want a bigger mat. It's not a better job, a nicer car. His desire is a body that works one that moves. He wants to be normal. Some way, somehow, this man or his friends found out about Jesus, and I think he probably told his friends, whatever it takes, get me to him. And so that's what they had to do. They couldn't get him through the door, so they went up on the roof, and they started tearing the roof up and let him down through a hole in the roof. And he gets what he's been wanting. Sometimes you have to work for what you want. You know, so many in the world today are spiritually in the same condition as this man. People today are spiritually crippled and paralyzed. Uh, they have no hope of any improvement. They don't know where to find the answers. They don't know where to turn. They don't know where to go, what to do. Uh, they don't even know exactly what it is they want. They turn to alcohol and drugs and entertainment, a life of no morals and no convictions, just whatever makes me feel good because that's all I get out of life. Oh, if I can just feel good for a little bit, if I can get someone to love me, if I can get some attention from someone, that's all I want. They don't really know what it is they're looking for and they just know that they're searching for something something that doesn't just give them some temporary satisfaction, but something that would speak peace to the storm that rages in their minds and their hearts and in their souls. Where can I find the answer? I don't know what the answer is, but I hope I'll know it when I find it. The end of the rotor, what does he want? If you would ask him, what would he say? He doesn't really know. He just knows he's very unhappy. 
He doesn't even know his options. He doesn't know that what he really wants is Jesus. He doesn't know what Jesus can do. He doesn't know who Jesus is. He may have heard about him, may even use his name when he's swearing, but he doesn't really know who Jesus is. He doesn't really know that Jesus cares. He doesn't know that Jesus loves him. He may have heard it, but he doesn't know it. And a lot of times I think people get to that point and they don't really believe it when somebody says anybody loves them. Especially somebody they can't see. He doesn't know about the love. He doesn't know about the joy. He doesn't know about the peace. He doesn't know that Jesus can help. And he doesn't know that Jesus can deliver him. He just knows that the ache has become so deep that he no longer cries himself to sleep at night. He's just become numb. He just knows that he no longer cares about life, his own or anyone else's. He knows that there's a deep hole in his heart that nothing seems to fill. There's a hollow emptiness that nothing quite satisfies, and part of his problem is that he's seeking a what when the answer is a who. Asaph may have said it best when he wrote in Psalm 73 and 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. I may preach again sometime about the acts and ways of God. If you look at the difference in Moses and the people, Moses, the people saw the acts of God. Moses sought the ways of God. I want to get close to him. I want to understand him. I want to know what he wants. I want to know about him. But it's a desire for God, a desire to know Jesus. When you're hungry, good night's rest doesn't do any good. You still wake up hungry. And when you're thirsty, no matter how good you can cook a steak, it's not going to satisfy the thirst. And when you're tired, a nice cold glass of water is not going to give you rest. And when you have a spiritual hunger, nothing else will do besides God, no matter what you try. You may want to write this down. You can't satisfy a spiritual need with something physical. It's not going to happen. People who are billionaires... And from what I understand, we have a few, a couple maybe in the world that are trillionaires. They're unhappy. They're always searching for more. They're trying to get more money. They're trying to get more power. They're trying to, why? What else do you need? Jesus satisfies. He puts his spirit inside you and changes everything. We all know what the plan of salvation is. Repentance, turning away from sin. Baptism in the name of Jesus that washes away the sin from your record. And then being filled with the Holy Ghost with God's Spirit coming inside. That satisfies. Brother Sisko told of Brother Lee Stone King telling him of an experience and said, there's a place in God where he will give you whatever you ask for. And when I heard him say that, I was like... I begin to wonder, you know, it's like, what would I ask for? What would it be? What do I want? What is the deepest desire of my heart? What would you ask for? What is it that you desire more than anything else in the world? What would be your answer? In the middle of your worship, God would speak to you and say, what do you want? Are you left speechless? Do you have a ready answer? What would Peter have asked for before meeting Jesus? Most of them judged their, their wealth by the number of animals they had, their property, how much they had. Um, 
He might have asked for a bigger house, better nets, bigger boat, larger fishing crew, maybe even a fleet of boats. If he could catch enough fish, he could have more of the things of this life, more stuff, a reputation as a success, a man of means. But Jesus didn't even ask Peter, what do you want? Jesus knew what he wanted. He wanted what every other fisherman in Galilee wanted. In Luke 5, starting in verse 4, it said, Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, big but there, but at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes in their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And when they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. After this one experience with Jesus, he and James and John walked away from a catch of fish that broke the net and almost sank two boats. It's like, that's not what I want anymore. His focuses and his priorities changed immediately. Some people need to have an experience with Jesus. They need a change of, of experience, a change of focus, a change of priorities, a change in the direction that they want their life to go. Jesus was suddenly more important than anything else in Peter's life. Now, that doesn't mean that he deserted his wife and everything and, you know, for sick all. Let's be reasonable. God gets no glory from that. But he did continue to love and provide for his wife and family, but Jesus became first in his life. If you put him first in your life, everything else is going to fall into place. Peter, James, and John walked away from their nets, boats, and fish and followed Jesus. In Psalm 34 and 10, David wrote, They that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. And what he's saying here is that you're so satisfied, you don't want anything. I'm full. There's nothing I want. David wrote it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't need anything because he provides everything I need. In Psalm 37 and 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. What will he bring to pass? The desires of your heart. If you have medical situations, financial situations, legal situations, domestic situations, relationship situations, mental situations, emotional situations, Etc. Whatever situations you have in your life, what do you want? Do you want all those little things fixed? I want Jesus. And I want more of Jesus. None of these things matter if you have Jesus. Perfect health is of no account without Jesus. You could have an IQ over 150 it doesn't matter if you don't have Jesus. It's trivial. A healthy relationship with your family, your spouse, whatever is hollow without Jesus. The perfect occupation is nothing without Jesus. You can land that perfect job, the great pay, the great everything, the great hours, benefits, but without Jesus, it's all flat. Having the world's greatest law firm at your command is worthless without Jesus. All the money in the world is of no account without Jesus. I want Jesus. Having all the power in the world is empty 
without Jesus. If I have Jesus, I don't need anything else. And if I don't have Jesus, it doesn't matter what else I do have. What do you want? What's your desire and what do you delight in? What do you seek? Go back and look at our text again in verse 11. It says, and they offered unto the Lord 700 oxen, 7,000 sheep. This is sacrifice. In verse 12, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart, with all their soul. There is some motivation right there. With all their heart, this is what they went after. In verse 14, and they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with cornets. Now we're talking worship. In verse 15, all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart. Now we're talking about commitment. Sought him with their, and sought him with their whole desire. They had a change of focus and priorities here. And he was found of them. That's what it takes. I was thinking today, you know, there's so many things that people would like to have, but all of it takes some kind of sacrifice. And it, is, it doesn't matter what, what it is. If you want to be rich, you're going to have to sacrifice stuff for it. If you want to be healthy, you're going to have to sacrifice some stuff. Usually your taste buds. Depending on what it is you want, you're going to have to sacrifice time. There's no telling how many different things you'll have to sacrifice because you can have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want unless Jesus is everything you want. So we need to worship God, not for what he has, not for what he can give and not what he can do. We need to worship him for who he is. We need to seek his face, his presence. I, I wish I could express it. I wish I could explain it. I um, wish I could show you my heart. I want more of Jesus. I don't know how to make anyone else love God. I don't know how to get people to be faithful and to be totally dedicated and committed to God. I only know that there's so much of God that's available, and I don't have all I want. I think I've said it recently, but God will never tell anybody that's close enough. Don't come any closer. You can get as close as you want. You're the one that sets the bar. And it's the same thing when it comes to doing, doing things for God. Somebody else might be able to play the piano better than you or the guitar or the drums or sing better than you or whatever it is. But whether someone out worships you or not, that's up to you. We've talked before about the dimensions of life, but I want to cover them again. The higher dimensions of life uh, liberate us in power, while the lower dimensions in life shackle us in captivity. And sometimes we think that we've arrived at the top when we just closed our eyes to everything above us. This is, this is good enough right here. I'm happy. I'm satisfied. I'm contented where I am. I feel fulfilled. Rethink of that, because there's more. Imagine a sphere going into a two-dimensional world. So we're talking a sphere going into a plane, going up and down through it, and he sees a line there, and he's trying to explain that he is a three-dimensional object, and the line, I don't believe you. There is, that, that, there, that's, there's no such thing. He says, watch, and he goes up and down, and he says, well, I see you getting smaller and larger. I just don't believe it. The carnal man and even some Christians can deny that there's more because they don't know how to relate to it. Listen to me. There's so much more that we haven't tapped into. Someone without the Holy Ghost may deny its existence because they don't know. They can't relate. 
God's spirit inside you? I don't believe that. They live in a world without the Holy Ghost. So it's easy to say, well, I don't believe that. And some people dismiss it so they don't have to face it. But we're going to talk about dimensions. We're not talking about levels. We're talking about dimensions. The first dimension is the dimension of the bug. Basically, food, sex, and survival. They reproduce. They satisfy their taste. They try to survive the elements or whatever. <coughs> they live only to the satisfying of the physical. People who live... I'm not talking about bugs. I'm talking about a bug's dimension. Alcoholism, addiction, prostitution. These people are controlled by desires, not morals. If it feels good, do it. Don't worry about it. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. Live in the now. They're all into instant gratification. I'm not going to wait for anything. It may not last they probably eat their dessert first. This is the dimension of stimulation of the senses. And they are trapped by the desires of the flesh. They're like infants. Give me what I want right now to make me feel better, and then I'm good. The second dimension is the dimension of the dog. It's kind of like the first dimension, but it adds a social aspect as it were. It includes family and friends. Now, two-dimensional people have a perspective of a few weeks to a few years. They don't see or understand the long-term consequences of their agendas and where they're going and what they're doing. They only consider life in their environment, life in their, their social group, their club, their team, um, their age group, their race, their gang, their whatever. That's all that exists for them. Everybody else, eh, we don't care about them. They don't matter. These are the people that you're going to see at the ball games because you get the crew together, go down there and yell and scream for somebody, play un pay ungodly amounts of money to watch somebody else have fun. Uh, they're consumed with interest in the lives of entertainers, actors, and athletes. This is the dimension of stimulation of the emotions. They do understand right from wrong, and this is where you will find usually adolescents. Children pass the infancy stage, but now they get to where they have, they understand family and friends and get together and, you know, me and my buddies and this kind of stuff. The third dimension, where most people live, a three-dimensional world, the dimension of one and two plus knowledge. Now, there's an intellectual desire in the third dimension, a world of knowledge and understanding. They want to know why things are, how things happen, make it make sense. Let's put things together, figure out where to come from, where is it going, what makes it work. It's the first dimension with purpose. There's a reason for living. Career goals, retirement plans. This is the dimension of the stimulation of the mind. Their life purpose has to do with the temporal world, though, not the eternal world. They can make conscious decisions to discipline the flesh, Athletes and different ones do that. They set a goal, and then they do whatever they have to do to achieve that goal. Now, in the fourth dimension, they go, wait a minute. Four dimensions? Yeah, we're going all the way to seven. The fourth dimension is a dimension of motion. It's not limited to time and space. And space isn't about my space, but about all the world. Time does not end with my retirement, and then I die. Time includes eternity. The fourth dimension is the beginning of the spirit world. Purpose stretches into the eternal. 
This is, a, this is a dimension of unity. This is a dimension of the stimulation of the spirit. High concepts include faith, hope, love, and wisdom. And this is a, a place of spiritual gifts and spiritual warfare. This is the first dimension that has spiritual warfare or spiritual anything involved in it. All the rest are all about the flesh. Mixed into the fourth dimension, though, are the will, the plan, and the works of Satan. So you have to beware. You have to be careful. This is what Brother Tim was teaching on fasting. God is not the only thing in the spirit world. When you get your spirit more sensitive to the spirit world, you better know what you're doing. You better know your word because he will come at you and twist God's word and fool you and you think God's talking to you. The fifth dimension is the dimension of dominion. It's a realm of total peace, true security, no real fear of anything. And as far as time is concerned, we see the end from the beginning. Again, no fear. You see the whole thing laid out and go, yeah, there's a process, but I'm not worried about it because I see where I'm going to end up. I see where you're going to end up. I see how you're going to, I see everything working together. And everything's going to be fine. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. That type of no fear. This is the dimension of prophecy. The blueprints of life are here in the fifth dimension. We have the revealed will of God in the fifth dimension. This is a place of perfect alignment. And the higher you rise in the spirit, the purer you must become. Remember the story of when they dedicated the tabernacle and when they dedicated the temple? With all the sacrifices and worship that went up, the Shekinah glory of God came down so strong that they couldn't stand to minister there. They had to get out. Remember the stories I've told you about Smith Wigglesworth? Same thing in his prayer meetings. People would have to leave. They couldn't stay there. The one minister said, I was determined I was going to stay. He said, I couldn't. I felt like I was going to die. The power of God was so strong. But imagine being in a realm where that doesn't bother you. It doesn't scare you or anything. It's just God's power just flowing all around you. Psalms 24 and 3, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands, we're talking about actions and behavior, and a pure heart, clean mind, motivations, and attitudes, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. This is, this is where you're going to get into a higher realm. That's when you can get all that stuff out. And just when you think you've got that stuff out, somebody ticks you off so bad you've got to start over. The sixth dimension is a dimension of pure power and creativity. This is where the creative plan is written. Imagine God letting you help write the creative plan. This is a dimension of creative miracles, the place of pure love, ultimate creativity, and great power. There is no selfishness here. Nobody's trying to hold anything for themselves. The gifts of the Spirit have complete free flow to the greatest degree. Now, I, I got these things from Brother, Brother David Sanzo's book, The High Places. Anybody remember when he came and preached our prayer conference? He brought a bunch of those books. I don't know how many people bought them. But he got this information. He heard a couple very, very prophetic men talking about it. And he thought, well, interesting. And then he heard another one talking about it. He said, hmm, there's more than a couple people that know about it. And then someone else, and finally he said, I've got to look into this. And he found a, a book where this material had come from 
that was out of print, he said, even before he was born. And I'm not sure who wrote it. I don't know what the name of the book is. I wish I did. I'd like to have a copy of it. But he wrote about the first quarter to a half of his book was about the seven dimensions. And this is something that when you're reading it, it's like, oh, God, I, I want this. And we got to seventh dimension, dimension of total unity with God. How many people have ever done that? Total unity with God. You know, some people couldn't care less about God or the things of God. They're so preoccupied with life and the things of the world and accumulating stuff. They let the devil manipulate them. They let their flesh manipulate them. They let their peers manipulate them. They let society manipulate them. They just always trying to go here and there and everywhere, and God's left out of everything. They rob themselves of a close relationship with God. But I have a dream, and I want more of Jesus. Could we stand? Let's praise and worship him right now, because he inhabits the praises of his people. You want, you want God to come down? Start praising and worshiping because he's going to show up. It, it, it works. It, it doesn't, it's, it's not magic. It's not a secret key or anything else. It's just that's the way God works. Let's worship him. Lord, we love you. You are greater than anything in this world. You have all power. You are love. We want to be like you, Jesus. We love you. We want you and we need you. We've got to have you more than anything in this world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. His pra your praises to him, your worship to him gets his attention. He moves he blesses, he fills, and you can move into his presence. You can have an audience with him in his throne room. So, Brother Cisco told Brother, um, so Brother Stone King told Brother Cisco, there is a place in God where he will give you whatever you ask for. But it's in worship. Brother Morgan talked about a woman that she was crippled. She was on a walker. I don't know, was it muscular dystrophy or whatever, one of those diseases. She was crippled. But she had her walker and she was trying to get around the church because everybody was running and shouting and dancing and carrying on. And he said he heard snap, snap, snap. And he said her limbs went straight. And he said that walker came sailing across the platform and she took off running. Not because somebody was praying for her healing, but her worship, her worship healed her. He also taught about, talked about a time when Brother Miles Young, one of the ministers in California, tremendous service going on, and Brother Miles Young started going, can you hear it, can you hear it, and fell over on the platform face first speaking in tongues. And when he came to, he said, God, let me hear what our worship sounds like when it gets to heaven. This is the most beautiful sound in the world. He deserves everything we can give and more. We're so limited. But if we can worship him with all of our hearts, we are working on developing and expanding into the next dimension. What you want, I want more of Jesus. I want to be closer to him. I want to be like him. I want to strive for total unity with him. I prayed for years to move me into the next dimension. It's almost like dimension seven is beyond something I can even reach for, but I want it. I don't know what it would take, but I want to be in total unity with him. We love you, Jesus.
Help us, dear God. <laughs> Jesus, we need you. Step in and control our lives, dear God, our minds, our desires, everything, Lord. Lord Jesus, give us the desires of our heart. 